Hi folks, welcome to QGCon Online. My name is Jess Rowan Marcotte, and I'm the lead co-organizer for this year's event. I want to open up this first QGCon Online presentation with some opening remarks, starting with a territorial acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we gather. Tonight, as we gather virtually, these are many and diverse. We recognize the continuing sovereignty of Aboriginal and First Nation peoples across the lands throughout which we work, make, and campaign. We pay our respects to elders past and present, as well as all Indigenous and First Nation peoples present. We recognize that sovereignty was never ceded and that this was and always will be Aboriginal and Indigenous land. We ask all present to reflect on what they can do to continuously support Indigenous self-determination. One place to start is the pay the rent movement, which encourages settlers to put a portion of their income directly toward material support of indigenous peoples. I myself am speaking to you from Jojage or Montreal. The Gagne Gahaga nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters of Jojage. It is known as a gathering place for many first nations. It is also the territory of St. Lawrence Iroquoians, Mohawk, Huron-Wendat and Haudenosaunee peoples. I ask that you also take some time to consider your own relationship and connections to the land that you live on. I also want to take the time to tell you that the QGCon organizers stand in solidarity with the Black community against all acts of racism, prejudice, violence, and injustice. Black trans and queer people have always been at the forefront of the modern queer liberation movement. When the Stonewall riots started, it was people of color who led us, including Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, a Black act activist and drag queen. It's important for the non-Black community to stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We support the Black Lives Matter movement and we stand in solidarity with those seeking safety and justice, who want to live without fear of being harmed for the same activities that white people have access to and enjoy, from bird watching in a park to going to a corner store. Please support these mo movements by donating to local bail funds or attending a Black Lives Matter protest in your area while taking precautions to keep safe from COVID-19. Black Lives Matter. Our sponsor for QGCon Online 2020 is Google Stadia Montreal. Thanks to Stadia's generous sponsorship, we've been able to provide honoraria to our speakers at a time when that support is truly needed, even more so than usual. Thank you. I also want to take the time to acknowledge the QGCon 2020 sponsors. Their sponsorship, which was intended for our May 2020 conference, will go towards supporting our next in-person event when it's safe for us to be together again. I hope that will be soon. I also want to thank you. All of you in the audience for being here with us, whether you're watching the premiere with us or coming to this video later. Thank you for continuing to support QGCon in these times, as we've come to call the decade since 2020 began. I want to acknowledge the difficulty of the present moment and take a moment to mourn that we couldn't see each other face to face this year. There are so many ways in which this, this pandemic has touched us all and our communities, and that's been hard. It's been discouraging. Now more than ever, the need for diversity and equity is clear. This year has thrown even further into evidence who is most affected by structural inequality and systemic oppression. The QGCon team sees it as our responsibility to support the intersectional needs of queer communities and beyond. Even online, our code of, con of conduct remains paramount. Normally, we would read this out loud together. Instead, I'll read it to you now. You can follow along here. The organizers and volunteers of the Queerness and Games Conference are committed to creating and maintaining an inclusive and accessible space for all participants. This means every step will be taken to ensure no one is mistreated or disadvantaged because of, of ability, because of ability, socioeconomic status, race, sexuality, age, gender, trauma history, religion, nationality, or any other factor. 
We recognize that many people are coming to our conference with different experiences and different understandings of privilege and social oppression, and mistakes may happen. Because of this, it is paramount that we encourage those who misstep to be open to listening and being accountable for their behavior. We also encourage attendees to give feedback about what they need to make the space welcoming and accessible. We expect QGCon to be a lively and friendly event where everyone is open to learning and treats each other with respect. Here are some guidelines to follow. Avoid making assumptions about other people's identity and experiences, including, but not limited to, their race, sex, sexuality, and gender. Others may disclose this information if and when they choose to. If you must ask, something, ask about something, like gender pronouns, avoid situations where a person may feel singled out, such as asking one person for pronouns in front of a large group of people. Avoid discriminatory slurs that, though potentially common in everyday life, will not be welcome at this conference. This includes language that is ableist, sexist, transmisogynist, six sexist, cis sexist, classist, racist, and other terms. If you are unfamiliar with these words and someone brings them up to you, respectfully ask them or a conference organizer to help. Internet search engines are your friend. Let everyone speak. Be mindful of whether you are dominating a conversation and not leaving room for others to speak, particularly if you are a person of privilege. Leave room for others to add their thoughts if a discussion seems one-sided. Listen to others if they say you are making them uncomfortable. If someone needs to be left alone, respect their wishes and allow them to re-engage on their own terms. Avoid public shaming. Instead, report your concerns to a conference organizer. If you'd like to discuss your concerns in detail, our inclusivity coordinator will help organizers and participants respond to these issues as a community so that we can all learn together. Those who do act in a manner that makes others feel unwelcome or disrespected, especially after an initial encounter, will be asked to leave the conference. Hmm. And with that, I hope that you enjoyed this first evening of talks in our QGCon online event program. Keep an eye for more every second Wednesday and for our special events on Saturdays. You can find the full schedule on the QGCon website. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Hibby Thack, and this is my talk on my project, A Cross-Game Look at Transgender Representation in Video Games. So a little bit about me first, uh, I use they, them pronouns, um, I'm a non-binary, a gender, queer, or something else, we don't know. Um, so I received my BA in Sociology from Temple University in 2020, uh, just this past spring. Um, and I'm currently an MA student at UIC in their Department of Communication. And I am a huge nerd and a huge queer, and this is my first QGCon, so I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so a little bit about what this talk is about. Um, this was my undergraduate research project at Temple um, through their Diamond Research Scholars Program. Um, and this project has actually been recently accepted for publication to Press Start Journal, so yay! Hopefully um, that'll come out later this year. And a big shout out to these people, the LGBTQ Game Archive, uh, for letting me use their uh, entries to analyze, and Dr. Adrian Shaw, who is my mentor and also um, creator of the LGBTQ Game Archive. Also a big shout out to Dr. Christina DeVoe, um, one of Temple's subject librarians. She was very helpful to me during this whole process. And a big shout out to Dr. Russell Webster, my loving spouse. So um, a few content warnings. This talk will deal with transphobia and the many ways it manifests in video games, including but not limited to mental illness alongside transness, trans panic slash shock scenes like the he's a she, kind of scenes, um, misgendering, and there will be stuff on sexual assault and transness as predatory. So very little research has been done on trans representation in video games. 
Um, trans identities have been included in research, but not many have focused specifically on transness. Some said, look at transness and the representation of it, but um, there hasn't been much singular focus on transness. I think that's really important because there's been a large focus on sexuality and binary gender, and transness to be studied separately as well. Why is this important? Transness and video games deserve to be studied. If we look at video games and compare it to film and television, um, it'll either provide us new ways or it could demonstrate that video games do the same things as television and film. They all rely on the same narratives. So how did I study this? Um, as I said before, I used the LGBTQ game archive. Uh, I looked at 63 entries on there uh, of trans-related content. And then I performed a content survey. Basically, I looked at all of these entries and looked at how trans characters were represented. And using grounded theory, I developed a code book from the themes I saw. And then I refined this code book and did two coding run-throughs until I had my final sample. And then um, there was a lot of clarifying gray areas because as many of you may know, uh, queerness and transness in video games is very hard to identify sometimes. Sometimes it's very ambiguous, but I think uh, Dr. Adrian Shaw, Shaw said this at some point in her research, that in video games a lot of what counts as queerness and transness um, is actions, and um, not so much the identities of those characters. So after coding, I organized my findings. And what did I find? Um, so I found seven notable trends. Um, they were ambiguity, dysphoria slash trapped in the wrong body, physical transition, mental illness, killer, trans shock, and trans reveal. So then um, I have this little table here uh, that shows like the frequency of how much I found it in the games. Um, also, these are not mutually exclusive. A lot of games had multiple of these. So as you can see, ambiguity is the biggest, um, followed by dysphoria and physical transition. A lot of these trends um, were differing forms of possible transphobia. So then I thought, let me collapse them together because a lot of them appear together and like are very similar. So uh, I made four overarching tropes. Dysphoria slash physical transition, mentally ill killers, uh, trans shock and reveal, and ambiguity. So starting with dysphoria slash physical transition, um, the American Psychiatric Association described dysphoria as manifesting in various ways, including strong desires to be treated as the other gender or to be rid of one's sex characteristics, or a strong conviction that one has feelings and reactions typical of the other gender. Um, so as for physical transition, this referred to changes in one's body that reflects one's gender identity. Um, so these two trends dealt with uh, how video games portrayed trans minds and trans bodies. This shows up in film and television research as well. So uh, there's this concept of the wrong body model by Betcher 2014. So basically the whole like, oh, I was born in the wrong body. Now I want to transition and be in the right body. The only problem with the wrong body model being a dominant narrative is transformativity, um, citing Vipon 2015. Uh, so transformativity is this concept of this dominant narrative becoming the only narrative for transness. So like when people think of trans people, they think, oh, you transitioned, you want to transition, which is not the case for all trans people. There are non-binary, gender non-conforming people and trans people, uh, binary trans people themselves who can't transition or don't want to specifically. I have two illustrative examples of this trope, um, Angoff from RuneScape and Naoto Shiragane from Persona 4. So Angoff from RuneScape. She is a non-playable character who runs a crystal armor shop um, and is the earliest known example of dysphoria slash physical transition in my study and on the archive. This is seen when players read one of her diary entries that says, In many ways, I am more myself than I've ever really been. No longer that little boy that fell trapped in a skin that was not his own. And also, if the player speaks to Angoff about her marriage to another character named Maldwin, she'll also bring up her transness saying, This body was born incorrectly male. I changed that. So there's this sense of power and authority in her story as she feels happier after her physical transition and she took it into her own hands. So as I said before, this is part of that wrong body model, which is not necessarily bad, but when it's the only narrative 
available. It excludes other trans people. So then next we have Naoto Shiragane from Persona 4. So Naoto is a playable character typically described using the pronoun she in the game and is known to wear men's clothing. So in the game, Naoto's shadow, which is like an inner self in Persona 4, um, prepares Naoto for a body-altering operation. So during this specific instance that it takes place in, um, the in-game protagonists battle Naoto's shadow to stop them from operating on the real Naoto. So this frames physical transition for Naoto as the wrong option for them, and frames physical transition as not a personal choice, but a choice that others can forcefully make. So transphobia occurs in this moment specifically because it makes the idea of physical transition seem so dangerous and wrong that it becomes the enemy of an entire mission in game. So the game also portrays Naoto as fearing no one will take them seriously as female, which led to their struggles with gender. To cope with this, uh, Naoto presents as male and never corrects anyone on their gender. So Naoto, unlike Angoff, isn't explicitly trans, but their storyline definitely echoes trans narratives of both dysphoria and physical transition. So here is a little frequency chart on dysphoria and physical transition um, by decade. So um, looking at this chart, we can see longitudinally uh, narratives of dysphoria slash physical transition have increased. They are appearing more frequently together in the 2010s. So this can tell us that games are possibly changing to include trans characters, but in ways that link transness to gender dysphoria and physical transition. So as narratives involving this model are much more represented in media, they become the dominant narratives for what transness means. So the next trope is mentally ill killers. So transness has often been linked with mental illness and uh, killing in film and television. Two illustrative examples of this trope are uh, the psycho from GTA Vice City and Alfred Ashford from Resident Evil Code Veronica. So the psycho from Grand Theft Auto Vice City um, is an enemy non-playable character in the game. Uh, he uses he, him pronouns, so he dresses as a woman to get close to the band Love Fist. His appearance in game, as you can see here, is very stereotypical as one is supposed to see that he is a man dressed in women's clothes. So the player is tasked with protecting the band and killing the psycho. Um, who is called this by the game specifically. <laughs> so the psycho kills a security guard and leaves a recorded message in Love Fist limousine, which is a bomb threat. So after this, the psycho is never seen or mentioned again. Um, and while this doesn't give any indication of the psycho's gender identity other than everyone using he, him pronouns, um, the game is relating gender dysphoria and gender nonconformity to mental instability. Um, with its portrayal of what seems to be a man dressed in women's clothes going psycho. Next, we have Alfred Ashford from Resident Evil Code Veronica. Alfred is a main antagonist in the game, and in the game, he helps his twin sister Alexia put herself in stasis so that she can conduct an experiment on herself. So while she's gone, however, his mental stability deteriorates and eventually he forms a second persona and this persona is also named alexia and he takes to wearing makeup and women's clothing so on multiple occasions he attempts to kill the protagonist and during events before the main story alfred had killed multiple prisoners on the island that the game takes place on so this again links mental illness with cross-dressing which is also related to becoming a killer so um, the separate frequencies for the two trends of mental illness and killers by decade are shown here. So you can see that mental illness seems to co-occur alongside killers, but only in the 1990s to the 2000s. This disappearance in the 2010s tells us that games have possibly changed to not link transness and gender dysphoria to mental illness. Additionally, it's important to note that mental illness and killer are still seen as frequently, but not in combination. And also, I'd like to repeat again, this is a limited sample from the LGBTQ game archive. This trend uh, echoes representation in other forms of media, where media has historically represented queer people as villains or monsters. Although not all trans people identify as queer, Halberstam 2018 states that trans people have been portrayed in film and television as dishonest, disoriented, and pathologically unstable. We can see this in several films such as Psycho by Hitchcock, Dressed to Kill by Leto, and The Silence of the Lambs by Bosman, Saxon, and Oot. 
So the next trope we have is trans shock reveal. So a little bit about trans shock and reveal. So trans shock refers to actual shock and panic around unexpected physiology or genitalia, like the real life trans panic. Trans panic refers to the legal defense applied in cases of assault manslaughter or murder of a trans individual um, after the assailant discovers different genitalia than expected. So trans reveal on the flip side refers to moments where transness is revealed without those elements of shock or panic. So two characters that illustrate this trope well were Chablis from Leisure Suit Larry 6 and Krem from Dragon Age Inquisition. So a little bit about Chablis. Um, so Shibli is a non-playable character in Leisure Suit Larry 6. Um, so the protagonist Larry uh, meets her for a midnight swim after completing required quests that lead to this date with her. So unaware of her transness, Larry begins to have sex with her. So when the game shows an erect penis under her clothes, um, he discovers that Shibli is a trans woman and subsequently throws up. Unfortunately, there is an after scene the next morning that implies that Shibli raped Larry, uh, as Larry seems to be disgusted and not consenting after learning that she is trans. So Shibli is a reversal of a lot of other instances of trans shock um, in both this analysis and real life, because instead of becoming a victim to violence after this moment, she instead commits violence against the person she shocks. So this reinforces the idea of trans people as deceivers, um, citing T.J. Billard's uh, 2019 work, um, which portrays them as hiding their transness to harm others. So then on the other side of this trope with trans reveal is Krem. He is a non-playable character in Dragon Age Inquisition, he comes out to the protagonist as a trans man. So in his coming out scene, um, other characters validate him in his gender identity, um, calling him a real man when he asks if he would be considered one in the Kunari culture, which is um, a separate race in Dragon Age. So they also reprimand the player if you pick transphobic dialogue responses. They reject the notion that he isn't a man because of the sex he was assigned at birth. And additionally, Krem has this authority and power in this scene as he makes jokes about binding breasts instead of other characters making those jokes about him. So as we can see with these two characters, um, the way transness is shown to both in-game and player audiences can either create moments of trans shock or trans reveal. So Shibli shows how non-trans audiences perceive trans people as harmful deceivers, and Krem shows how games can respectfully portray transness. So uh, looking at this chart, there seems to be a change in these portrayals of transness. Trans shock seems to change into trans reveal in the 2010s, as you can see from this chart. So it shows a steady decline from the 1990s to the 2010s, um, with trans reveal first appearing in the 2010s. So this could indicate a change in how developers and producers perceive trans people, or a change in what content is deemed acceptable. Um, many narratives of transness and media revolve around these ideas of suffering and violence um, in television, film, video games, is anything. Um, so these representations of trans shock changing into trans reveal could possibly show an increased respect over time for the betrayal of trans identities in video games. And then the last but not least trope um, is ambiguity. It actually is the largest trend slash trope. Um, Every other trend was collapsed into a trope with another trend except for ambiguity. It appeared often enough to be its own trope. Um, it specifically refers to gender ambiguity, uh, specifically instances where characters' genders changed in localization or over time are not explicitly stated and or are left for interpretation. So this doesn't really connect with existing scholarship on other Western media, um, as most research has focused on explicit trans content. So uh, two characters uh, from this analysis that illustrate this trope well are Poison from Final Fight and Zero from Borderlands 2 and 3. Poison uh, is an enemy non-player character in the US version of Final Fight. Um, so she was originally supposed to be a woman, but she was described as a transvestite or someone who wears clothes of the opposite sex. Um, because developers thought U.S. players would not be comfortable hitting women in a game. 
She's not the only example of ambiguity regarding gender identity changing during localization, but is the earliest case to my knowledge. Producers intended for her to be a man wearing women's clothing, but this changed as producers made different comments on her gender identity over the years. So in 2011, Capcom stated that it would not take a stance on her gender identity, um, despite Final Fight's developer, Yoshinori Ono, in 2007, saying, In North America, Poison is officially a post-op transsexual. In Japan, she simply tucks her business away in order to look like a girl. So, many lists of trans characters in video games online include her as a trans character, despite this ambiguity regarding her gender identity. This mystery around her gender identity comes from changes in localization or over time, as we see. So, this leads to a lack of specificity in how we can define her gender or sex. Without this explicit confirmation of her gender identity and other characters like her, um, what little trans representation there is in video games uh, remains implicit. However, not all trans people wish to disclose their gender, um, but a back and forth of labels given by producers shows that they don't really care about a definitive stance on her identity. So, Zero is a playable character in Borderlands 2 and Borderlands 3. So he's referred to with he, him pronouns in-game, but he has been read as non-binary by fans due to his whole appearance and character being shrouded in mystery. So the CEO of Gearbox Software, Randy Pitchford, also referred to Zero using gender-neutral pronouns on a panel at PAX in 2014. So without any official confirmation on anything about Zero, he's left to be a very ambiguous character. So from these two characters, we can see how games can be very ambiguous when it comes to trans content. Um, Poison shows the importance of looking at the context of localization, and both she and Zero show the importance of looking at producer comments to gain further context. So um, both also reveal how ambiguity most often shows up when characters are described as mysterious or left to interpretation. Because of changes in localization, um, as we can see from this chart, ambiguity showed trans by country specifically. Uh, ambiguity seems to be more prevalent in Japan than it is in any other country in this analysis. Um, this, however, may be from the English bias in this project and the LGBTQ game archive. So, being unable to analyze the Japanese texts, um, this analysis comes from a limited perspective. Um, however, ambiguity in games specifically has not yet been analyzed in Western uh, game studies and Western media studies. Um, this may shed light on a starting place for such studies. So, to conclude, this project found trans representation in video games uh, differs across decades of release and country of origin. As said before, video game studies should be analyzing transness both alongside sexuality and on its own. If film and television are able to separate the two and still analyze them together but separately as well, then video game studies should also be doing this. And video games are a unique art form and medium. But in terms of trans representation, this study, other than with ambiguity, has revealed that video games are not too different from film and television and deserve the same attention. So, thank you so much.
Hi everyone, my name is Edo. I'm a film and media scholar working on the urban history of transmedia in Japan. My research explores the forgotten histories of women's and queer media mix. And today's presentation will apply my latest discoveries in terms of gay media history to Japanese gay games. So simply put, um, I will discuss a brief genealogy of queer techniques of visual expressions that emerged in manga but traveled into video games. And I hope that this perspective will be useful for everyone, scholars, gamers, and creators alike. So I know that this is a game conference and what I'm doing might seem a bit controversial, but the core of my argument is that queer representations and manga animation in games in Japan did not simply start with the simple representation of queer characters. There has been a convergence of these representations of queer characters with certain techniques of visual expression crafted mostly within the interaction with, between manga, porn magazines, and literature since the 1970s. And my goal is usually to bring a queer or women's theory practice and perspective into these histories of Japanese transmedia and pop cultures. So what happens if we look at how queerness has been expressed through techniques of moving images? Compared to other configurations of moving images, queerness in Japanese media tends to use stillness, sometimes to the extreme, to expose inner monologues, hidden sexualities, and intimate space and psychological dimensions. Queer in manga, and probably in video games too, is not just a queer character trait, it's also a queer composition of visual elements. As such, queer movements usually subvert the focus on corporal motion by slowing the narrative and also physical progression of characters. This dynamic stasis often appears in slash romances, uh, yaoi or BL, but also inside of grassroots gay comics, here illustrated with the famous sex scene uh, drawn by Yamakawa Junichi. So how, when, and why did Japanese video games, well, gay Japanese video games, integrate this legacy of slow and sexy images? Well, gay games in Japan rely mostly on famous manga or fanzin artists, and therefore have integrated a very long history of techniques representing the body and agency of queer characters. After World War II, the representation of gender in manga expression was usually focused on the development of characters as moving bodies. But in the 70s, female and gay artists raised against the definition of a character just based on its corporal attributes. Their exploration went beyond corporal mobility to find a subjective layer inside of the image. In this context, I usually call queer animation techniques in Japan sexy stillness because of their focus on naked bodies, sexual tension, and also intimate moments. The work of Mori Naoko and Saito Takuya in particular are useful to frame the evolution of sexy stillness techniques from the representation of an inner agency, so finding a valid queer subjectivity from within, in the 70s to a mutual queer agency, so finding a valid queer subjectivity through a romantic relationship or sexual intercourse in the 1990s. So in short, sexy stillness is a technique about reconciliating the body and the soul, the external and subjective experiences of a character who have a non-normative gender or sexual identity. On the technical side, queer motion in Japanese popular culture varies from illustrated poems or novels elements towards, I would say, limited animation and cinematic montage. Its main characteristic is to interrupt corporal motion with the introduction of inner logics of character representation. 
Sex is still a majorly has of course transformed through the decades with the social agenda of new generations of female and gay artists who have progressively entered the market of video games in the beginning of the 2000s. So I propose to quickly look at the history of gay games in Japan before exploring a specific example with Tokyo after school summoners, Hokago Samonazu or Hosamo. My angle here is to see how techniques of animation in the gay manga scene were transferred into the gay game scene. How did still image techniques transformed with other technologies of animating or playing? So our history starts mostly with PC games in the late 1990s or early 2000s produced by small or amateur developers and manga artists. We can think about the Hotari series by Tarita Tarimonia in between 2000 and 2005 and if one was even ported to PS2. Uh, we have the King of Beasts and Graduation series by Gas, now known as Joniak. In terms of genres, these games are mostly visual novels branded as a more immersive form of pornography. Players can choose to be active or passive in sex scenes as well as the sexual orientations of characters. In the mid 2000s and early 2010s, Many famous fans and artists, including Mizuki Gai, Moritake, or Nodagaku, produced their own game based on CG packs. And one of the most well gay games of the time is probably the Hanks Workshop in 2004 by legendary artist Masanori. This period also brings a few new genres into the mix, including RPG, simulation games, or shooting games like Sugar Shooter, here represented. But I would say that the most recent transformation mostly occurred in the 2010s with the expansion of mobile games. Small companies like Life Wonders, who made Efkareshi, Hosamor, and the brand new Life a Hero, or Kiwi Fruit Studios, who made Gi last year, have successfully launched long life applications mixing RPG and gacha games. In terms of an overview of the relation of gay games to illustration and sexy still image techniques, I would say that gay games in Japan rely on games as a technology to animate or synchronize CG. They usually mobilize limited animation and dubbing to give life to gay art. Many games emerge from manga artists play with flash games or limited animation of CG packs. The origins of gay games are therefore grounded into this negotiation of the translation of usually paper arts and crafts into digital modes of animation or visual composition. As such, the inner dimension of images that used to be mostly expressed through still images and inner monologues has shifted towards limited animation and dubbing. So let's take a specific example. So in terms of gameplay and progression, Tokyo After School Summoners or Hosamo is a gacha game where you have to collect cards and it's mixed with the tactical RPG. This means that player needs to pay in-game currency or <laughs> real money to access new characters randomly distributed and build their teams. In terms of content, there is a main story that's pretty long. There are personal quests per characters, but also seasonal events. I have to say that fights are only PvE, but there is also a friend support system to borrow characters from other players. And obviously seasonal characters are very rare and also very naked and are the most powerful and difficult units to get. I would summarize the main characteristics of Hisamu as follow. So again, it's a game card and a tactical RPG that is built with the gay fanzin community, mostly in Tokyo. It relies on sexy still images to collect inside of a gacha that are drawn by many different gay artists and mostly well-known gay artists. Most characters are on the LGBTQ plus spectrum and the narrative itself is questioning what love means as a notion and how it's at the center of the construction of social norms. In terms of gameplay, progressive in Hosamu's stories, love stories, and even events is 
asking players to win certain fights against enemy teams. Hosamu gameplay is therefore alternating in between an adventure game with a visual novel interface and a tactical RPG. You can touch the screen to move a character and reorganize the position of your team. All characters will attack automatically after the movement phase. Placement is therefore key, but so is team composition. Characters have attributes, skills, and stats. Skills will have a certain person chance of activating upon certain conditions and it asks player to find an adequate balance in between healing, buffing, debuffing, you know the drill. But what is specific about Hosamo is the animation of characters during battles. Characters are represented by a still image that usually activates a voice when touched on the screen. When attacking, activating a super attack, or getting hurt, characters will speak random lines. Developing characters therefore asks player to interact with different types of limited animation of a single same image. Inside of a visual novel, inside of fights, during level up screens, the image itself is not really moving, but it is synchronized with voice lines, text, and limited motion. This limited animation reveals in part how Life Wonders has incorporated its collaboration with gay illustrators and manga artists. Illustrations are the incentive to pay for the gacha, go further in the game, as well as the base for character development and the basic UI. Even, even the item mechanics reinforce the importance of still yet animated images drawn by gay artists. Characters can equip a memory, which is basically a CG, a CG illustration, to buff their stats and even gain new skills. These images will appear when performing super attacks and add more images and limited animation into battles. Sexy still images and their animation are therefore key in the visual presentation of the game, its game mechanics, and the introduction of queerness and characters. It is a literal translation of the visual techniques of gay fanzin into a video game. The main story is about a person who wakes up in a post-apocalyptic version of Tokyo, so kinda Shin Megami Tensei, but with sexy LGBT people. <laughs> its, character, its chapter focuses on one guild, a team of characters representing the 22 districts of Tokyo, as well as a mythological world, so Nordic or indigenous or Japanese folk tales, as an example. The scenario progressively unravels the identity and mission of the main character who must free Tokyo from its social or religious rules. As such, player can freely choose between five images, two genders, and five voices to represent the main character, but in fact, all of them are canon. The main character is, in fact, all of these incarnations and has no specific sex, gender, or sexuality. Tokyo is trapped inside of a time loop, a convenient time loop, and each iteration creates a new incarnation of the main character with new romantic adventures. The main character is therefore every single possible sex, gender, or sexuality, and player may customize their own story through dialogues inside of the adventure game part of the game. And this includes also asexual and aromantic variants. This rich lore of a main character who embodies a spectrum of identities are, is both, I would say, problematic and pleasurable in Hosamo. Mostly because it shows a problem when they thought about the integration of diversity. The main character represents many different characters who have been exiled from different societies because the way they love or think their gender is different from the norm. And as such, the game narrative proposes to reflect upon what makes society rules valid or not, and what happens to people who are left aside these rules. Despite this openly queer narrative, since 2017, the game has been under attack from trans fans for not having enough trans representation. Sh shady users rightfully called it an L capital G B T game, 
with a large amount of male cis gay characters. And this idea of leaving the spectrum of identities opened is great in theory, but the story and content of Hosamo is mostly created via a specific gay community who focuses on erotic illustration of men. Again, illustrations are key to the development of the narrative, but also of the content of the game. Life Wonders has therefore invited since 2019 UD artists, but also trans artists, to contribute to a more diverse cast. So in conclusion, what I wanted to talk about today is that since the 2000s, gay games in Japan have mostly grown around funds and conventions and are as such mostly advertised and produced by gay artists who started mostly as illustrators and manga artists. In a way, their work has been in the past two decades to adapt the art of sexy steel images to new engines, gameplay and game design. And I think that this scene represents an interesting model with transmedia effects across fanzine and manga, but it also asks many questions about the ethics of work of companies working with grassroots artists about remuneration, because it's not really well known if the artists are always remunerated, also the visibility of artists and also the rights of artists themselves. And a final thought it goes also to this question of inclusivity of non-cis gay male representation in games, especially when most of these games tend to be labeled as LGBT, like Hosamo. Finally, uh, if we have time, I would like to add just a simple thought about why it's important as academics to look also at gay games and also how gay games are related to fanzine. So a question that I usually get is, okay, but why, why is this like queer anyways? Because everyone is doing the same thing. And as you might know, a few people who are extremely well known in the field mostly of otaku studies like Tom Lamar have said that, you know, otaku and fandoms in Japan are using images that are modulable and can be animated across various scale of technologies. And it's kind of the same for everyone because it's about personalized form of technologies, images, and a relation therefore to sexual or queer representations, right? I'd like to say that I think that we've been overlooking the specificities of how certain people use technologies to animate in a way or in different way their characters. And one thing that is extremely interesting about gay games in Japan is that they usually use these images made by gay artists, but they will never really animate the image itself. It will remain a sexy still image. And that doesn't happen inside of other games. So maybe people will say that it's a technical limitation, but I think that it's actually something that is pretty much embedded inside of their media history. Thanks for your attention. I'm looking forward to Q&A.